We're here on the day of Pentecost, final service of this festival of God, this second of the three festival seasons. And this particular day is a day whose meaning is very much tied up with the story of the people of God. When God first began to work through a group of people, through a church, he began his church on the day of Pentecost. We read of that in Exodus 19. The congregation of Israel, the church in the wilderness, as it is called. And when God got ready to begin his church under the New Covenant, the New Testament, he chose the day of Pentecost as the day of beginning. We read of that in Acts chapter 2. This is a day whose meaning is very much tied in with the story of the people of God and God's working with his people and their response to him. In Psalm 133, verse 1, we read a very beautiful sentiment that certainly expresses God's desire for his people. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That has always been the desire down through time that God has had for his people because God's ultimate plan and purpose is that his people might dwell with him as a part of his family throughout eternity, dwelling together in unity and in harmony. I would like for us to look this afternoon at the story of the people of God and to understand some vital lessons concerning unity and concerning endurance. As we look at the story of the people of God, we find that when God began to work with his people, calling out a nation, calling out a congregation, a church as it were, called the church in the wilderness, the congregation of Israel, when we read in Exodus chapter 19, as God brought them to himself, God proposed a covenant. We read in Exodus 19.1 in this third month, and this of course is the third month, Pentecost always comes within about the first week of the third month in God's calendar. The children of Israel came to Mount Sinai. And God reminded them in verse 4 of what he had done, how he brought them out of Egypt, brought them to himself. He told them to obey his voice and keep his covenant, and they would be a peculiar treasure above all people. He told them that they would be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And in verse 7, Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the words which the Lord commanded him, and all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Now here was unity, here was harmony. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. There seemed to be great unity, great rejoicing, and great excitement that greeted the establishment of the congregation of Israel. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, we have the story in chapter 1 of Christ's ascension into heaven, and the disciples waiting. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house wherein they were sitting. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, here were the people of God gathered together with one accord in one place. The story of God's Old Testament church began with God's people gathered together with one accord in one place. The story of God's New Testament church began with God's people gathered together with one accord in one place. The story of the people of God is going to culminate, as we saw yesterday at the marriage supper of the Lamb, as at least the first fruits, the part of the people of God that are symbolized by this day of Pentecost. And of course, all that are there at that feast that marriage supper described in the book of Revelation, they're also going to be with one accord in one place. However, as we go through the story of the people of God through the centuries, 
both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find that unfortunately the people of God have not always abided with one accord in one place. Just as we can read in Exodus 19 the story of how the people said, All that the Lord has said we will do. We don't have to read very far through the book of Exodus before we come to chapter 32, which occurred about six weeks after the event recorded in Exodus 19. So here we are, six weeks down the road, and in Exodus 32, verse 1, the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain. The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and they said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought, up, brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. He's gone off up in the mountain, and we don't know what's happened. So Moses, Aaron collected the earrings. He, of course, had been left in charge. Uh, he was the one that, had, uh, uh, that Moses had left as responsible. He was the high priest of Israel. And Aaron got caught up in this whole thing. And as we find the story, as we come on down, that a golden calf was fashioned. And Aaron built an altar in verse 5 and made a proclamation that tomorrow is a festival to the Lord. God told Moses to come down the mountain, and when Moses came down the mountain, we find in verse 19 that as he drew near unto the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hand, and he broke them beneath the mountain. Here were the people of God in turmoil. A matter of six weeks before, they were gathered at Mount Sinai, and they heard the voice of God, actually the one who became Jesus Christ, the spokesman, the Logos, thunder the words of the Ten Commandments. The people that responded, all that the Lord has said we will do. Six weeks later, there was turmoil, there was confusion. And we find that certainly the overwhelming majority had forgotten the covenant to which they had agreed just a matter of weeks before. Aaron was an individual who seemed to be heavily swayed by the influence of people around him. We read later on his sister Miriam stirring him up and getting him in trouble on various times. Aaron seems to have been a man uh, whose basic intent was good. But Aaron was a weak leader. As long as he was there with Moses and assisting Moses, uh, Aaron did fine, because he did. He backed up Moses. But Aaron seems to have had a difficulty when he was surrounded by others. Here he was influenced by the people. You can go back to the numbers and you find where he was stirred up by his sister and various other accounts. We could go through the history of the Old Testament. We could go through the book of Judges, and we could see the ups and the downs of the people of God. We could go through Kings and Chronicles. We could go through Ezra and Nehemiah. We could look at the ups and the downs of the people of God. We could look at the times of turmoil. We could look at the times of reform and revival, and we could look at the times of deterioration and decay. And what we find, unfortunately, as we go through, is that most people simply go along in order to get along. If everybody else was going to worship the golden calf, they worship the golden calf too. They threw the golden calf out, fine, they, you know, they'd do without it until something else came along and got them stirred up. Well, we say, you know, that, of course, is the history of the congregation of Israel, the Old Testament church. The church in the wilderness, they had the law, but they didn't have the Spirit of God to write the law in their hearts and in their minds. Surely when God began to deal with his New Testament church, when he poured out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and all of God's people were gathered together with one accord in one place, there weren't very many, only 120 disciples upon whom the Spirit originally came, all gathered together with one accord in one place, surely, surely the story would be different. Well, we read of these 
events in Acts chapter 2, and they're exciting and they're thrilling. And if you try to put in your mind's eye to place yourself there at that time as one of those Jews gathered there in Jerusalem, having come in for the Feast of Pentecost, this remarkable occurrence taking place, dramatic occurrence there in the vicinity of the temple. And here were thousands of people gathered around, and a tremendous miracle occurred. People heard the word of God proclaimed in their own language, because here were people from all over the known world, people from the Parthian Empire, people from throughout the Roman Empire, people from all over the known world, Jews who had come to observe this Feast of Pentecost. And they heard the wonderful words of God spoken in their own language. And it was a remarkable occurrence. And we're told in Acts chapter 2, when Peter told them to repent and to be baptized, we find in verse 41 that they, gladly re- they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. About 3,000 individuals responded. Now, these were individuals that certainly knew the law of God. They were Jews. They had come there to observe one of God's festivals. And as they heard Peter go through and explain from the Old Testament Scriptures that Jesus of Nazareth, who had been crucified in Jerusalem just a matter of seven weeks earlier, had been raised from the dead by the power of God, and that he was the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ. They saw the outpouring of the power of God, and they believed. And 3,000 people were baptized. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. That wasn't all they were taught. They, were, they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and of prayers. And there were signs and wonders. And here were these people who had just come in for the feast, just like many of you, you know. Many of you have come in here from all over. Just a handful actually live uh, in Lafayette. And, you know, with our modern transportation, if you live in Baton Rouge, that's no big deal. You can be back there in about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Uh, some of you coming across from Houston have a little further to go, or some of you from Lake Charles, uh, wherever you may be uh, coming in from, some from uh, up in Alexandria or down, uh, uh, you know, down even in our own church area, down New Iberia, Morgan City. You can be home within a relatively short period of time, but you know, uh, if we didn't have modern transportation, it would be a long time. People came, they were prepared to stay for the festival. And they didn't want to leave. These were exciting times. We find that there were many people there in Jerusalem who simply liquidated their assets, donated everything they had. People remained there. It was an exciting time. We read of tremendous miracles that occurred, like in Acts chapter 3, where the uh, marvelous healings that occurred, where Peter... Uh, healed the crippled man at the temple, told him, rise and walk. We find these events that occurred, these tremendous sermons, the tremendous miracles. As we go on through the story, we find in Acts chapter 5 that the very shadow of of Peter, Acts chapter 5, verse 15, the very shadow of Peter passing over some of these individuals, and they were healed. Tremendous results occurred. The whole city was in turmoil. People were excited. We find, as we come on through the story, that now, a couple of years down the road, that one of the first deacons in the church, a man by the name of Stephen, was taken and arrested and murdered, killed. You know, this was the first time something like that had happened. And it created great consternation. In fact, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, we find there was a young man by the name of Saul who was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at this time, 
there was a great persecution against the church of Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So there was a scattering that took place. External persecution, external problems and difficulties brought about a, a scattering out of God's people. We could go on through and focus on some of those things. Persecution began to build. So the first time Peter and John were placed in prison, when Peter was, was placed in prison, the church prayed and God sent an angel and opened the doors and brought Peter forth. A little later on, we read of other things that occurred. God didn't always respond in quite so dramatic a manner. We find that there were problems that began to come upon the church from the outside. We find, as we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that there were problems that began to arise from the inside. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, we find that there were problems that were simply people problems. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians probably around 55 A.D. So here we are about, 20, uh, uh, about 24 years after the time that we read of in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when all the church was gathered together in one place with one accord. And now as Paul writes to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 11, he says, It has been declared unto me, of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? There were personality conflicts and problems, and people were dividing into factions based on someone that they liked, and whose style they liked, and there were internal personality conflicts. There were difficulties. But those were not the most serious problems that we find in the early New Testament church. These were not the most serious causes of turmoil that began to arise, that began to erode. That beautiful description of all of the people of God gathered together with one accord in one place. When the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of 2 Thessalonians, which was one of his earliest letters, 1 and 2 Thessalonians seem to be the first, the earliest uh, letters that Paul wrote in terms of, uh, of chronology written in 2 Thessalonians, written probably in the fall of 50 A.D. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, as Paul talks about various problems and turmoil, that seem to be extant, and here we are, you know, just a matter of 19 years after the events of Acts chapter 2. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, or verse, uh, um, verse 7, he says, For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now let or restrains will continue to do so, will continue to restrain, until he be taken out of the way. Now, the mystery of iniquity was already at work. This was the mystery religion, the Babylonian mystery religion that taught lawlessness. You can read of the beginnings of some of this in Acts chapter 8, when we read of a man called Simon the Sorcerer, Simon the Magician, Simon Magus as he's known in secular history, who began an association with the church and tried to purchase an apostleship. He was the great religious leader of the Samaritans, people who practiced a form of the old Babylonian mystery religion. Paul writes here in in 50 A.D., that already among the people of God there was no longer a circumstance. Everything was with one accord in one place because there was something that was at work. The mystery religions 
that work lawlessness was at work and was having influence in the early New Testament church. It was a time of trial. It was a time of turmoil. It was a time of bewilderment and confusion for many people. The situation did not quickly improve because we can read in Second Corinthians, written just a matter of about five years later, probably about the fall of 55 A.D. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is warning the church at Corinth. Now, he had warned the church at Thessalonica, and here, elsewhere in the Greek peninsula, he warns another church, the church at Corinth, a place where he had spent quite a length of time. He said in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That was Paul's desire. But he said, I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we've not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you've not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted. You might well bear with it to ask in the form of a question. Paul was concerned, greatly concerned, because you see, the devil does not believe in truth in packaging. He doesn't label things for what they are. And Paul was very concerned about the church at Corinth because there was turmoil. He talked about in verse 13 about individuals who he, whom he labeled false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So here was turmoil going on in Corinth. Paul had addressed the situation in Thessalonica that the mystery religion that taught lawlessness, disregard for the law of God, was already at work. Here he warned the Corinthians about things that were coming in, promoting turmoil, promoting confusion. In the 60s A.D., right at the end of Paul's life, in the mid-60s, about ten years or so after he had written these words to Corinth, Paul wrote the final letter of his life. He wrote it to a young man, a young evangelist, that he had nurtured and worked with since this young man was a teenager. And Paul knew that his life was at an end. He was in Rome, he was in prison, and his life had just about come to a close. And Paul saw things on the horizon that deeply concerned him. It deeply concerned him for the church and for Timothy, because Timothy was a man considerably younger than Paul. Timothy was a man who was going to have to continue to live on for a period of time, having to deal with some of these matters, and Paul would no longer be there to guide him. And Paul reminded Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, well, actually picking it up a little earlier in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, uh, let's go ahead and pick it up in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 1, Paul said, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. That was Paul's parting advice to Timothy. What is it that a minister of God is instructed to do? To preach the Word. Preach the Word. Be instant. In season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Preach the Word, Timothy. He said, the time is coming 
when they won't endure sound doctrine. It was a time of turmoil, and Paul could see the handwriting on the wall. He knew that there were many who were increasingly coming to a point that they did not wish to be rebuked and chastened with the Word of God. They wished for an easier, softer way. And he said, the time will come when they won't endure sound doctrine. After their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want somebody to make them feel good and to say, that's all right, that's okay. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch you in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Show that you're the real thing. How do you do that? Paul told Timothy. He said you preach the word. You be instant in season and out of season. Whether it's popular or unpopular. You don't take an opinion poll. Find out what the truth is. He says, I'm now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. He said, Timothy, I've come to the end of my road. My ministry is finished. The last period has been placed after the last sentence. And what I've done, and what God has used me to accomplish, Paul said, that's over. But the work of God isn't over. The history of the church is not over. He said, Timothy, you're in a time of turmoil. You're in a time of chaos. You're in a time of upset. Timothy was a young man that didn't see, that was not a man that liked conflict. He was a young man that seemed to frequently get discouraged. Paul had loved him as a son. And he said, Timothy, I'm giving you some parting advice. I'm not going to be here to help you. I know that my life is at an end. But he said, Timothy, you're going to have to make it on through because your ministry is not at an end. Your life is not at an end. And you've got to do something. You've got to preach the word. There are going to be those who are not going to like it. They're going to turn away. But Timothy, you need to keep on keeping on. Within probably a year of the time that Paul wrote this letter, Jude, who was a brother of Jesus Christ, son of Joseph and Mary, therefore technically a half-brother, wrote... There's only one chapter in the book of Jude, and he, Jude wrote in these same times, the same circumstance. You know, our, our glimpse into the history of the New Testament church and into the turbulence and the turmoil is something that we have to glimpse through the letters that are written. Jude wrote in, in Jude, and in verse 3, he says, Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You should earnestly contend. He said, you're going to have to fight and struggle to hold on to the truth. Because Jude writes in the late 60s A.D., there are certain men crept in unawares. You know, if they had been recognized for what they were at the beginning, they would have been dealt with, but they weren't. When you study church history, you find that at least two of the men that are mentioned by the Apostle Paul as his helpers, a man by the name of Linus, 
and a man by the name of Clement. Now, any of you who remember Catholic history, remember that the names of the first two bishops of Rome were Linus and Clement. Individuals that are mentioned in the scriptures, mentioned in Paul's writings, individuals that ultimately played a part in developing the early Catholic Church. In fact, one of the epistles of Clement survives to this day. It's in the book of the Apostolic Fathers of the Catholic Church. It is the oldest book or writing that remains after the completion of the New Testament. It dates to within about five years after the death of the Apostle John, to around 100 A.D. Perhaps Jude didn't even know the full role that Linus and Clement were going to play, though Linus was already at work in Rome at the time Jude wrote. And Clement continued a watering down that occurred there in Rome that introduced a turmoil and a confusion among the people of God. Jude told people at the end of his lifetime, the late 60s, he said, you'd better earnestly contend for the faith once delivered. There certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lawlessness a watering down of the law and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So he reminded the people, he said, God knows who's who and what's what. You hang on to the truth and God will deal with these problems. Peter, in Second Peter, writing perhaps within the same year that Jude wrote, the very end of the 60s A.D. in Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, Peter writes right at the end of his life. This was a time of turmoil. These were not the giddy, happy, exciting days of Acts 2 and 3 and 4. It was not the days when the shadow of Peter passing over someone and they stood up and walked. It was not the days when all the people of God were with one accord in one place. It was a time of confusion, a time of hurt, a time of disillusionment, a time of bewilderment. It was a time of turmoil. Turmoil that had not arisen primarily from without the persecutions turmoil that had arisen from within. In Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, Peter said, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false, pro- false teachers among you, he told the people. So Peter reached back to the history of the Old Testament and he said, You know, there have always been problems that have existed and that have occurred among the people of God. The history of the people of God is not the history of of smooth sailing. It is a history that is fraught with turmoil. God allows that turmoil because it is in the context of that turmoil that a sifting and sorting occurs. God wants to know what's in our heart. He wants to know what's in our heart. The reason God allowed ancient Israel to wander through the wilderness for 40 years was to test them, to see what was in their heart, whether they would obey him or not, regardless. He said, If there were false prophets among the people, Peter wrote, there shall be false teachers among you who privately, secretly, clandestinely, shall bring in damnable heresy, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. He didn't say, well, now look, all people of God are going to see through this, and these guys come up with all this stuff, boy, everybody's going to know. He said, many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words, pretended words, make merchandise of you. 
whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. God didn't spare the angels that sinned. If he didn't spare the old world in the time of Moses, if he didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, then God knows how to take care of his people and protect them through difficult times. Times of turmoil, times of chaos, times of confusion, times of hurt and bewilderment. Peter felt it incumbent upon him at the end of his life to warn the church. As we come forward in the history of the church, about 30 years, we pick up the book of Second John. John wrote his epistles, evidently at the end of his life, in the 90s A.D. Second and third John give us a little insight into what was going on at this point in time. By this time, all of the original apostles were dead. Most of the early church leaders were dead. Timothy was dead, various others. The Apostle John was the only one of the original apostles yet living. In Second John, in chapter 5, he warned the church because he also was by this time at the end of his life. He said in Second John, we'll notice in verse 5, Now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which you had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. You see, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning. You should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come or is coming in the flesh. Speaking of Christ actually coming to live his life in us, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look not, look to yourselves that you lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If there come in an, any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that bids him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. Now, you know, from our perspective, we wish that John had written some of these things with paper and ink, that he had given names and details that we don't really have. But it was a time of turmoil. It was a time of confusion. There were those who were, there were any number of things that were going on. In fact, within about a year later, in the third epistle of John, he writes of an even more ominous situation. In verse 9, he says, I wrote unto the church. But Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he does, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids them that would, and cast them out of the church. Incredible. The people of God were not all with one accord in one place. Here, by the time of the end of the lifetime of the Apostle John, here were individuals who found themselves in positions of power and authority and control who were in some cases, as in the case here of Diotrephes, actually casting out of the church true believers, true Christians, who remained loyal to the Apostle John. The story of the church in Jerusalem, which was originally the church that was the headquarters church of the New Testament church, we read, you know, the story in the book of Acts, we read in Acts 15, all the apostles and elders coming up to Jerusalem. The apostle James, not the, one of the original twelve, but James, who was the brother of Jesus, and also the brother of Jude, was the leader there in Jerusalem. Jerusalem 
He was a remarkable man known even among the Jews as James the Just. He was killed, murdered, in 62 A.D., thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and beaten to death with clubs. He had been the leader of the church in Jerusalem since its inception. His place was taken by a first cousin by the name of Simeon, a man who was the son of Cleopas, you read of Mary's sister, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus, you read of her sister. Simeon was her sister's son. So he was a first cousin to Jesus Christ, first cousin to James and Jude. He was the successor of Jude, or of James rather, as the leader of the church in Jerusalem. A matter of seven years after the death of James, a remarkable occurrence occurred on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. This was Pentecost of 69 A.D. It's recorded in the writings of Josephus, a Jewish historian that wrote just a few years later. There was a great rumbling and peal of thunder that was heard in the temple on the day of Pentecost in 69 A.D. That was a remarkable event because there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And what sounded is simply a tremendous clap and roll of thunder to all the people there in Jerusalem was a voice that was clearly understandable and intelligible to those who were the true people of God. And the voice said, let us remove hence. And the church, under the leadership of Simeon, left Jerusalem immediately after the day of Pentecost in 69 A.D., removed themselves beyond the Jordan River into a remote little community, a remote little area known as Pella. The story is told in many church histories. I have some material Xeroxed out of Gibbon's history of ancient Rome, where he goes into the, uh, uh, his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, chapter 15, that deals with the story of Christianity and its impact in the Roman world. And he tells some of these events. Simeon led the Jerusalem church to Pella. Within a very short time after then, Roman legions appeared unexpectedly, cast a siege about Jerusalem, which endured for a number of months. And finally, in the summer of 70 A.D., the citadel of the temple was breached. The, te the temple was destroyed and burned. The walls were destroyed and burned, and the people were slaughtered or sold into slavery. The New Testament church, the Jerusalem church, had left just in time. Now, quoting here from Gibbon's History of Rome, he says, the history of the church in Jerusalem, uh, he mentions here, he says, the first 15 bishops of Jerusalem were all circumcised Jews, and the congregation over which they presided united the laws of Moses with the doctrine of Christ. Now, after Simeon's death, Simeon died in 107 A.D. He was the last of the first generation of Christians to die. A first cousin of Jesus Christ, one who grew up with a direct and first-hand personal knowledge. He was the last of the, the first generation of Christians to die. And in the interim, over a period of about the next uh, 18 years, there was a succession of 13 different leaders of the Jerusalem church, which was located in Pella, still called the Jerusalem church. It was an unstable period in that entire area. In the early, about 130, 131, a Jewish leader by the name of Bar Kokhba began a revolt against Rome that resulted in Roman legions coming in and totally destroying Jerusalem with the idea of forever banishing the Jews. They destroyed everything that they could, and they banished the Jews from the area, and a new city was built named Aeola Capitoline. Termed the Law of Moses with the Doctrine of Christ. In other words, they continued to practice the teachings of of the entire Bible. They continued to keep the Sabbath and the Holy Days and all of the other things. That came to an end in 135 
AD. The Gibbon says that uh, the, uh, as he described, he said, when numerous and opulent societies were established in the great cities of the empire, in Antioch, Alexandria, Ephesus, Corinth, and Rome, the reverence which Jerusalem had inspired to all Christians uh, continued to diminish. The Jewish converts, or as they were afterwards called, the Nazarenes, who had laid the foundation of the church, soon found themselves overwhelmed by the increasing multitudes that from all the varying religions of polytheism enlisted under the banner of Christ. And the Gentiles, uh, who rejected the weight of Mosaic ceremonies, at length refused to tolerate their more scrupulous brethren. We find here, as he goes on, he talks about the fact that of the Romans, they, exasperated by the repeated rebellions of the Jews, exercised their rights of victory with unusual rigor. The emperor founded under the name of Aelia Capitolina, a new city on Mount Zion, this was the emperor Hadrian, to whom he gave the privileges of a colony, and denouncing the severest penalties against any of the Jewish people who would dare to approach its precincts, he fixed a vigilant garrison of a Roman cohort to enforce the execution of his orders. The Nazarene, which was the term that was used for the true Christians now in Pella, had only one way left to escape the common prescription. They elected Marcus for their bishop, a prelate of the race of the Gentiles, most probably a native either of Italy or of the Latin provinces. At his persuasion, the most considerable part of the congregation renounced the Mosaic Law, the Sabbath, the Holy Days, in the practice of which they had persevered above a century. By the sacrifice of their habits and, per and prejudices, they purchased a free admission into the colony of Hadrian and more firmly cemented their union with the Catholic Church. The word Catholic simply means universal, the universal church. There remained an obscure remnant of the Nazarenes who refused to accompany their Latin bishop. They preserved their former habitation of Pella, spread themselves into the villages adjacent to Damascus, and formed an inconsiderable num number or an inconsiderable church in the city of Berea. Well, these individuals, this handful, refused to go along. There was a time of great, this was a time of great confusion, of great turmoil, because you see, in Rome, within a matter of years after the death of the Apostle John, within a period of about, uh, about 17 or 18 years after the death of the Apostle John, there was a custom that was instituted in the church at Rome, which was a replacement of the Passover service with a celebration on Easter Sunday. This began, even according to Catholic historians, uh, during the time of the sixth bishop of Rome. Uh, we would date it to about 118 or 120 A.D., about 20 years after the death of the Apostle John. We could go on. It was a time. It was a time of turmoil. It was a time that brought about confusion. It was a time that brought about the consequence of exactly what the early apostles had warned, the things of which Paul had warned, and Jude had warned, and Peter had warned, and John had warned. It was a time when more and more there was turmoil, there was upset. There were all sorts of things because, you know, the, what became the Catholic Church did not emerge full-blown. There was a continuing of the celebration or recognition of the Sabbath even in Rome up until the mid-130s A.D. as a reaction against the Jewish revolt in Judea. Harsh penalties were brought upon the Jews everywhere. 
Now, the pernicious heresies that Jude had spoken of and Peter had spoken of were the idea that Sabbath-keeping is not necessary for salvation. They continued to do it as a tradition, but they said, you know, it's not really necessary for salvation. It was a distortion of Paul's teaching about grace. The consequence of that, they went along without a lot of visible change until about 131-132 A.D., and when these severe prescriptions came down and tremendous persecution came upon the Jews in Rome, the Bishop of Rome said, you know, there is no reason for us as Christians to be lumped in with the Jews. Since we merely observe the Sabbath as a custom, there is no reason for us to be put to death for something that's not necessary for salvation. And so a pers- the distinction took place. And within just a matter of time, these, these problems, these underlying problems that Jude had warned, that Peter had warned, came in. Other issues came around. The uh, book that is the Pelican History of the Church by Henry Chadwick, uh, Chadwick, the early church, has a section in here dealing with one of the problems that arose just to show you the way in which things gradually developed and the fact that literally, in some cases, centuries occurred before things that were taken for granted at a later time were even acceptable at all. Chadwick writes in his history of the early church in the chapter on worship and art, he says the second of the Ten Commandments forbade the making of any graven image. Both Tertullian, who was the early Catholic father that was actually the originator of the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, and Clement of Alexandria regarded this prohibition as absolute and binding upon Christians. In fact, the only second century Christians known to have had images of Christ were radical Gnostics. Gnostics were the followers of Simon Magus. This is the second century. This is over a hundred years after the time of Christ. Before the end of the second century, Christians were freely expressing their faith in artistic terms. Early Christian paintings appear first not in churches, but as funerary decorations in the Roman catacombs. The style of painting is not dissimilar to that found on many ordinary pagan houses at Pompeii. The motifs of pagan convention, which the Christians used, were symbols that were capable of Christian reinterpretation. The earliest known example of a church with which pictures on the walls, uh, with pictures on the walls, is the is the third century house church at Dura on the Euphrates. The Spanish Council of Elvira recorded its shocked disapproval of some churches with paintings on the walls, but the fact that such places existed was not suppressed, and the tide became a flood in the course of the fourth century. About 327, the learned historian Eusebius, who was an early Catholic bishop and historian, received a letter from Emperor Constantine's sister, Constantia, asking for a picture of Christ. She evidently supposed that an authentic likeness was more likely obtainable in Palestine than anywhere else. Eusebius wrote her a very stern reply. Understand, this is a fellow that served as the secretary at the Nicene Council and and the uh, proclamation of Sunday and Easter and the Trinity is mandatory doctrine. But by this time, but even at this time, uh, he was shocked by a request like that. He wrote her a stern reply. He was well aware that one could find pictures of Christ. They were for sale in the bazaars in Palestine, and he had himself seen them. But Eusebius did not think the painters and shopkeepers selling these mementos to pilgrims were Christians at all. Similarly, at Caesarea, he had seen a group of a bronze statuary in which a woman, bending on one knee, stretched out her hand as suppliant uh, to a standing man whose hand reached toward her. From Eusebius's description, the group was evidently a type familiar on Hadrian's coins, showing the emperor restoring rights to his provinces. By 300, however, Hadrian was forgotten. The citizens of Caesarea Philippi were now interpreting the bronze pair to represent Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood and could even show visitors the house where she lived. Eusebius' attitude to the statues 
is one of interest, but he takes it for granted that only pagan artists would dream of making such representations. Well, the point is that many, many of these, of these matters developed over a period of centuries. It was a time of turmoil. It was a time uh, of hurt. It was a time of persecution from without many of the times, and it was a time of turmoil and difficulty uh, from within. What is the response, or should be the response, of God's people? What was the response of the people of God during those times? Those who remained as the people of God, because there were many who followed these ways, who were caught up in these things, who did not contend earnestly for the faith once delivered, who were caught up and who were confused and who simply went along in order to get along. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, Matthew 24, 12, he said, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Endure unto the end. What, what is it to endure? The word for endure means to patiently wait, to abide. Now, how are you to patiently wait and abide, and where are you to patiently wait and abide? In Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, talks about, in verse 7, verse 6, it says, "...who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life." That's what those who seek for glory, honor, and immortality will receive is eternal life. How do they seek for it? By patient continuance. The word translated patient continuance is exactly the same word used back in Matthew 24, "...he that shall endure to the end." Those who shall patiently continue, continue in what? Patiently continue in well-doing. Those who patiently continue in well-doing. When Christ said endure to the end, he, talk, he was talking about patiently continuing in well-doing. In Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. In verse 19. He talked about the fact of in Luke 21 and verse 16. He talked about you'll be betrayed by parents and brethren, kinfolks, friends. Some of you shall they cause to be put to death, being caught up with resentment and bitterness. You'll be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there'll not a hair of your head perish. In your patience, possess you your souls. The word patience here is the same word, endurance. Patient endurance. Patient waiting, patient continuing in well-doing. In your endurance, you will hold on to your lives by enduring, by patiently continuing in well-doing. Let's notice back in the book of John, back in the book of John, chapter 15, a familiar section, Christ spoke it in the night of his final Passover. In John 15, 1, he said, I am the true vine. So who is the vine? The vine is Jesus Christ. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and the branches that bear fruit, he purges it. Verse 4, he said, abide in me. The word abide here is the same word, endure. Patiently continue. To abide in Christ means to patiently continue in Christ. Patiently continue in me, abide in me, and I in you. The branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. The vine is Jesus Christ. To abide in Christ means to patiently continue and endure in well-doing, abiding anchored in Jesus Christ. He talks about in verse 6, if a man abide not in me, if a man does not patiently continue in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire and they're burned. 
If you abide in me, if you patiently continue in me, if you endure in me, and my words endure in you, they patiently continue in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. Continue, patiently continue, endure, abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. You shall patiently continue in my love. Tied in with keeping the commandments, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. You see, back in 1 John chapter 2, in 1 John chapter 2, in verse 6, on up in verse 4, it says, uh, in verse 3 of 1 John 2, it says, Hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that says, I know him, and keeps not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keeps his word in him truly is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that says he abides in him. He that says he endures in Christ. He that says he patiently continues in Christ ought himself also to walk even as he walked. To abide in Christ is to walk as he walked, to follow him. On back in verse 17, we're told that the world passes away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God shall abide forever, to endure to the end. The only way that you and I can endure to the end is to do the will of God. To walk with God, to walk with Jesus Christ, to walk as he walked. In 2 John, verse 9, we're told, Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Whoso transgresses and abides continues not or endures not in the doctrine of Christ. To abide in Christ, to endure unto the end is to patiently continue in the doctrine of Christ. The key to bringing the people of God through the turmoil of the first and second and third century, the key to bringing the people of God through the turmoil and the ups and downs of the history of the Old Testament church, the congregation in the wilderness, the key to bringing the people of God through the turmoil of all time and all centuries, is to abide in Christ. That is, to abide in his doctrine, in his way of life, to patiently continue. That's why we're told in John chapter 8, the Gospel of John, chapter 8, and verse 31, Jesus said unto those Jews which believed on him, well, they believed on him, they acknowledged the messenger, but they didn't believe the message. He said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue, same word, endure, patiently continue, if you endure in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Enduring to the end means continuing patiently in God's word. If you continue in my word, if you patiently continue and endure in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Enduring to the end doesn't just mean warming a seat. It doesn't just mean keeping your chair warm. It doesn't mean just standing rooted, planted in a geographical location. You know, the church that returned from Pella to Jerusalem continued in Jerusalem, and there's a Jerusalem church to this day, but it's not the church of God. It traces its origin back to the group that came to Pella, came from Pella. They continued in Jerusalem, but they didn't endure and continue in Christ's word. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, if you patiently endure in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. That's the real key. That's what all of God's people ultimately must do. And God allows us to be tested through difficulty and turmoil, 
as to whether we will patiently endure in the word of God. And God has allowed that through time and through the centuries. We're told in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 24, All flesh is grass, and all the glory of man is the, gra- is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower thereof falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. See, God's word is what endures, that's what lasts. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You see, that's what Paul reminded Timothy of in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We read earlier 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul warned Timothy about some of these events that were occurring at the going to occur and continue to occur after the lifetime of Peter was pa- or Paul was passed, things that Timothy would have to live through. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 12, he said, Yes, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is what Paul warned Timothy about. He said, look, Timothy, don't think that everything's going to be a piece of cake. Don't think there won't be any problems. Don't think there won't be difficulties and adversities. What do you do? Continue. Endure. Patiently continue. Continue you in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you've learned. How deeply rooted are you in the truth of God? Ultimately, that's what everything comes down to. How deeply rooted are we in the truth of God? Do our roots run shallow or do they run deep? Timothy was told to continue in the things that he had learned and had been assured of, that he knew that he had proven. He knew it and he knew that he knew it. From a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, may be complete, thoroughly furnished in all good works. For to abide in Christ means to abide in his doctrine, to abide in the truth, to walk with him. If we're to abide, if we're to endure, that's what endure means, to abide, to continue patiently, It means that we're going to have to walk with God. We're told of Enoch that he walked with God. We're told of Noah that he walked with God. We're told of Abraham and others that these were men of faith who walked with God. They walked with God. They continued with God. They abided. They endured. Let's notice in closing back in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, in verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, all these men and women of faith who've gone before, who've endured, who've gone through things that you and I have never faced, we're encompassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You've not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We're told as we come on down that God's chastening never seems pleasant at the time, but it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, verse 11, to those that are exercised thereby. So we're told here as he recounts the story of Israel of old coming to Mount Sinai, that they could not endure, verse 20, that which was commanded. Then we're told in verse 22, you are come, you, the New Testament church of God, are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, to the God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So, We're told in chapter 13, verse 1, let 
brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds. We're told in verse 5, Let your conduct be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If we continue in him, if we abide in him, God will never turn away from us. But many of the people of God, and Hebrews 12 and 13 talks about that, there are those with whom God has worked that have turned away from God. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I'll not fear what men shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, which have spoken unto you the word of God. And you look that up in several different translations. And the emphasis is on remembering, calling to mind. These were individuals who had guided them in times past, who, as it is plain in the context here, verse 7, individuals who were now dead. He was calling to mind to remember those that had guided them, who had spoken God's word to them, whose faith follow considering the end of their conduct. You can see the results of their lives and the conclusion of it. Understand and remember that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Be not carried away with different and strange doctrines. For it's a good thing that your heart, that the heart be established with grace, not with meat, not with the, the sacrificial system that they had had, which have not profited them, which have occupied therein. For we have an altar. Our altar is not the temporary altar of physical sacrifice. Wherefore, Jesus, that he might sacrify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate, verse 12, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We have no continuing city, no enduring city. You see, the history of the people of God in the New Testament is not the history of a continuing city. The Roman Catholic Church can point to a headquarters in Rome and to a continuing city, to a geographical location to which they can point and say, we have a continuity of our history that stretches back for centuries. We have a direct line of succession. They have a continuing city, but they've not continued in the truth. The Church of God does not have a continuing city. It has a continuing truth. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Brethren, every one of us, in the weeks and months and years ahead, between now and the culmination of this age, must walk with God. We must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You must never kid yourself that all you've got to do is occupy a geographical location and warm a seat somewhere, and you're taken care of. What you have to continue with is the truth of God and the way of God. You've got to yield yourself and walk with God, to walk with Jesus Christ, to abide in Christ, to continue in his doctrine, to deepen your roots in God's Word. And brethren, if we abide in God's way, if we abide in God's truth, if we hold fast God's faithful Word, then we have a guarantee. Because God will never leave us nor forsake us. He will help us and guide us. He will direct us and bring us through. The church of God started on the day of Pentecost in 31 A.D., and all were gathered together with one accord in one place. How wonderful, how beautiful. It didn't last. It didn't last because Satan has not yet been bound. And when the sons of God come together, inevitably the devil comes in among them. We read that in the book of Job and certainly indicated other places. God has allowed that. He has allowed that sifting and sorting to test his people to see what is in our heart. Whether God's word and God's way means more to us than anything or anyone. 
Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.